Uh, my name is Robert Sandell, also known as Bobby. Uh, I'm a software engineer at CloudBees. I'm James Nord, also from CloudBees in the UK. And um, I guess we should start off saying why this talk is called what it is. Um, you've probably already, uh, as you're interested in Pipeline, been to see Jesse Glick speak, who um, was one of the main authors behind the Pipeline project type. And um, we were coming to move um, some of our jobs over to use Pipeline. And kind of as we were doing things and we'd hit some issues, Jesse would come over and look at it and go, mm, no, you shouldn't be doing that. So we're quite fortunate to have uh, Jesse in the company who can come and say that to us. Um, many of you, are, or most of you, are probably not in the same boat. So we thought we'd impart his wisdom that he imparted onto us onto you. Yeah, so the reality in mid-2015 Maybe yeah. you can recap. So um, mid-2015, um, just slightly after Jenkins, uh, the Jenkins conferences uh, last year, um, we kind of sat down as an engineering group and said, OK, things aren't quite right. We've got a lot of jobs all over the place. Everything's automated, but nothing's joined up together. Um, and when I said everything was automated, some of the stuff wasn't. So um, we'd have Stephen Connolly, who uh, you may have uh, seen a talk from. Um, he would be the one that would release a lot of our plugins uh, from his laptop. Uh, so he'd start the release, and then he'd say, right, I'm going for a run. I'll be back in two hours. Nobody commit anything. Um, and and then, then he'd yep. call up Kosuke, who went down into his basement to release and sign the actual war files. So uh, up until about eight months ago, all of the releases that CloudBees had done, if you'd ever looked at the signatures, which presumably no one had done because nobody had complained, they were all personally signed by Kosuke, um, which was great. Um, but you know, yeah. and um, I mean, we, we also had a lot, every single plugin had their pull requests built and daily integration builds and stuff like that. But I mean, everything was just disjointed. Yeah, and we would manually kick off the tests run. Um, they would run overnight. Um, there was no single point for us to go and say, what is the health of the project or what is the health of this product? It was littered around kind of hundreds of different jobs and there was no consolidated view. Um, Plus, when you're trying to get a release out the door because of a security fix and KK's in an airplane at 30,000 feet, that kind of is a bit of a problem. So kind of the vision and the solution we had was, OK, pipeline. Pipeline will solve everything. It will solve the world's problems. Um, so we can automate this ETO with pipeline. Um, we can kind of change from creating the installers in his basement to automating that with a pipeline script. Um, and we needed to do this on a constrained environment. So this isn't your normal Jenkins environment. We were running on our own product, which was Devit Cloud, which is a slightly more locked down version of Jenkins. Um, so we'd want to kind of, every time we wanted to do something, we want to build, package, and test, and, and even release uh, all of our products and plugins. So that's kind of uh, two slash three products. Um, so the CloudBeast Jenkins platform. Um, but yeah, and we had like three different, besides the normal JUnit tests that we have for plugins, for example, there is three other different test suites that we also want to hook into this and not having to run that manually. I mean, it would be really nice if we could run that every time a plugin is released, maybe? Yeah, but you know, if we just run it every time we release, if something's broken, we're not going to find it out until we released it. So we want to run it on every merge, don't we? But it would be a lot better if we make sure that the main line is always releasable. So we should do it before it gets in. So on every pull request. OK. But that's just not our plugins, because we've got open source plugins in our product as well. Yeah. So every time an open source 
plugin has a new pull request or a new commit or a new release, we want to catch that so that our customers don't suffer. Yeah. Oh, um, but we're, products are based on Jenkins as well. So we've got to do that for Jenkins Core? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have multiple platforms that we are releasing for. We have Debian packages and RPMs and Docker images and that Hesky Windows. Uh, yeah, Windows. Mac packages as well. OK, so we can't kind of just have this sprawled out. We've got to have some form of reusability across everything. Um, and it's going to run across everything. So we want some form of co-review as well for this. Yeah, I mean, the pipeline is code. And all code should be code-reviewed, because this is going to be a complex thing that we build. OK. So. OK, we'll, we'll try and talk louder. Um, is it me or Bobby that you're struggling with? Bobby, All right. So I'll go something like this then. <laughs> OK, um, so we kind of end up with something that looks a little bit like this. Um, we want to build the packages and test the three, pro three products. Um, there's five packages per product. There's over 100 plugin dependencies. Two lines of Jenkins open source. Um, plus the security ones, because we maintain four extra ones as well. Um, so we got the LTS and the non-LTS, because we need to make sure something's not broken before it makes it into LTS. We've got somewhere between three and five test suites. They're kind of three, five. And on every commit, pull request, release, that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, one of the also main reasons we want to do this is because workflow, as it was called then, for those of you who remember that far back, uh, that's now pipeline, we wanted to use that as well to sort of practice what we preach. Yeah. Sort of eating our own dog food. No, no, no. no I don't want to eat dog food. No, 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 no. that's too pessimistic of a view. Yeah. Uh, let's take a page out of our some peeps over at IBM's page, and let's call it drinking our own champagne. Yeah, uh, let's <laughs> drink our champagne. I yeah. like that. So yeah, part of uh, so part of this is we were telling people, you know, pipelines, pipelines, great. Um, pipeline will solve solve the worst problems, um, but we obviously need to prove it. Um, there were certain things that were done as pipeline, but we hadn't got a big pipeline orchestration for a flow within Cyclab. So that was another aim of the project. Yeah. So we sort of started out with some base requirements that we wanted for this champagne project. Like, we want to code review our pipelines. That's almost number one, because we want to share the knowledge that we gain by this. Uh, we, we need to reuse them, because we've got 100 odd plugins. We don't want to write the same thing everywhere and 100 times, and when it changes. Yeah, and I mean, and building times. a pull request and building a, on a commit, ver and, or either building a plugin and putting that in a war file, or just taking a released. That's sort of the same thing, just some steps before. So we should be able to modularize it. Yeah. And also, of course, we need to run on our own product, drinking more champagne of a different brand. Uh, uh, oh, and there's those open source plugins as well. Yeah. OK, that's quite simple. Um, so code review, we already use GitHub. It's got pull requests. It's got comments. So you can kind of do code review. Yeah, it's, it's not as good as Garrett. No, it's not as good as Garrett, but <laughs> it'll do. Yeah. And there's the Global Pipeline Library. Um, so for people that are unaware of what the Global Pipeline Library is, there is a Git server inside of Jenkins. And with Pipeline, you can have a Global Pipeline Library. You can push um, uh, classes and um, variables um, into a, a directory structure in this Global Pipeline Library. And then yeah. that gets automatically put into all of your pipelines. 
So you can have your shared libraries. You don't need to do anything to pull them in or load them. They're just automatically there. Yeah, and then the, the sort of job config itself would just be one single line of code. Or maybe a two or three to kind yeah. of build it, test it, and deploy it. Yeah. Kind of thing. OK, that's pretty simple, right? Mm. But <laughs> yeah, we can't use the global library on Devit Cloud because that means you need super user access. Yeah, and, and there is also the, the issue with the SSH port not being forwarded correctly on that cloud instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're prototyping, so I don't want to pass objects around because then that's going to kind of when you change the method signature, you're going to break everything. So let's just use global variables. Yeah, but when you use those global libraries or fields or whatever you call it, I can get code completion in my IDE. Yeah, but I don't care about that. I don't want your code changes Yeah, but to that's break because me. you're an Eclipse user and can't use code completion. I yeah. want to use that. So I'm going to pass variables around so that I can get type definitions. OK. So what are we <laughs> going to do then? So, yeah. OK, let's store all of the libraries and flows on GitHub. We can't use the global library, but we can kind of write some code that will pull the stuff in from GitHub, load it up, and inject it in there. And we can kind of bootstrap, right? Yeah, and just avoid religious wars during the prototyping phase. We'll fix that later. Uh, yeah, we'll fix that later, <laughs> yeah. So our kind of first attempt um, at doing this, um, if you can kind of see, we've got the actual flow is at the top, and then the function at the bottom is a bootstrap. Um, so the idea being, once we've fixed how we can sort out the global library, we can move all of that into a global library, and you've got one, one line of code or a few lines of code that will actually run the flow. Yeah, and then we just hide that loader thing on the bottom, because we'll fix that later. So the Really, it's pretty simple. We're getting a, a node. And we don't really care whether it's a Windows node or what it is for this. It, it no, could be anything. We're just you know? checking out a Git and Yeah, so checking it out. And then we're using the load step to actually load and source some Groovy files. That's pretty simple. And for most intents and purposes, it works. It's kind of a fair amount of boilerplate we've got to put around everywhere. But it's pretty static. Yeah, and then later on, we could sort of, we made a plugin called the Remote Loader plugin. Yep. Or actually, Oleg wrote it. Thank you, Oleg. Uh, that made this boilerplate code a little bit easier to handle. But yep. by that time, we had already done quite a lot. Yeah, we'd and, kind of written like about. Uh, we have learned stuff. a couple of things, and we didn't, by the end, really want to use that. We wanted to do something a bit better and cooler. But it wasn't really available until this week when Jesse released the uh, at the shared library feature. So yeah. Um, now we're going to refactor our entire library. Of but. course we're going to refactor <laughs> everything, yeah, because we're going to have loads of time to go back. So don't do what we did. Here's the new shared library function. And OK, so the first thing we wanted to do was, um, once we could load up these flows, we obviously had to build and package the installers. Um, so these are open source code. It's the same installers that are used to build the uh, Jenkins MSIs and RPMs. They run on multiple platforms, Debian, OS X, Windows. Um, they run linearly, so it, run, it builds the Debian, then it builds the RPM, then it builds the Windows one, and then it builds the OS X and the SUSE. Um, it requires some Snowflake servers. It uses a very old disk fork plugin, which allows you to run arbitrary commands against the Jenkins cluster from just from a, a, a normal shell, not from within Jenkins. Um, Oh, yeah, but there was also one other thing that we need to have approval before we push to production, because Spike got really scared that we would just be pushing stuff live to the production site without anyone going, yeah, that's OK. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So it's kind of a bit of a mess as it was. So the simple thing for us to do is kind of like fix the installer scripts. Um, 
not run them linearly. We've got pipeline, we can run nodes. So we can get a node that's a Windows node, and then we can just run batch commands on that. We can get a Debian node and run the Debian commands. We can get an OSX node, run the OSX commands. And um, there's tool installers in Jenkins, so we don't have to have like Snowflake. We could use the tool installers instead of having special slaves. Yeah, and we can run all this in parallel as well. So because it's pipeline, we can do all of these packages at once. So rather than taking 30 minutes to generate everything, we could do it in three or four minutes. Yeah, and Jenkins is a web server, so we could just put the installers there temporarily for approval. Yeah, and we can download them from there as well for the testing in the later stage as well, just by yeah. having them as an artifact or whatever. OK, so that's simple, right? Eh, but. <laughs> No. Um, so we started off trying to refactor this and change everything. But the, there's make calling bash, bash calling bash, which then calls other things, which calls into batch on Windows. There's a bit of Ruby thrown in for good measure as well. And trying to unpick all of that was a mammoth task and a headache. And um, I yeah. remember going on vacation and coming back, and you were still working on this. Yeah, but I was so close. I was always <laughs> so close. <laughs> it's always just that next bit, and you fix the next bit, and you find, oh, it's like peeling an onion, only the onion wasn't that size. It was like that size. Um, oh, yeah, and the custom tool plugin wasn't really pipeline friendly, and it didn't quite work. Yeah, so we right. can't really use the tool installers. OK. So. Let's kind of give up on doing the, the good thing and just kind of be OK. We just need to produce the installers, right? Yeah. OK, right. So all we need to do, run make dist, get some approval, run make publish. Simple. What could possibly go wrong? But <laughs> yeah, um, to get the approval, we don't want to have an approval from one person. We want to have an approval from a number of people, because if KK or, or whoever is the approval person goes on holiday and we can't publish the binaries, that's an issue. Um, but pipeline with an input, you can only restrict it to one user or one group. And we don't have group support on our authorization system, do we? No. Oh, oh bugger. Um, and the disfault plugin ignores nodes properly. And when you run make publish, if it hasn't got the files, it rebuilds the files. So then we're going to rebuild the stuff which isn't the stuff that's been tested and approved. So OK, right. Um, let, let's not even bother being OK. Let, let's just kind of chuck it together. Um, let's have Snowflake slaves. Um, we can still do the input outside of the node. Um, that's not a problem. Um, we need to kind of fix make, and we need to get the files from one node to another. Um, so when we started, uh, the only way to get some files from one node in a pipeline to another node in the pipeline was to actually archive the artifacts, which means you would end up with a huge sprawling mess of your entire workspace archived uh, in Jenkins just so you could transfer some files. Um, but quite quickly then, the stash and unstash steps came yeah. along. And that helped quite a lot with yeah. this. Yeah, managed to convince Jesse that that was a brilliant idea quite early on. So that was good. And we want to keep make happy. So let's just kind of keep make happy, run a simple shell script. And once we've unstashed everything, the timestamps will all be wrong. Make will think it will need to rebuild. So let's just reset the timestamps. That'll do. Yeah. So, so lessons learned from this, make your thing work first with what you already have, like wrapping just the thing you already have in a pipeline, and, uh, and then go back and incrementally improve that. Yeah, so all you need is something that will work first, and you can then incrementally improve it. You could take a tire analogy, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, The wheel that you've got might not be able to take you NASCAR racing, but it'll at least get you down the road and round to the corner shop. You'll get there in the end. You can't drive that fast, but it'll do. So rule number one, don't, don't. put build logic in the pipeline. Yeah. That's, that's good, because it's just an orchestration framework. It's yeah. not for build logic or anything like that. Yeah. But we need to control the flow, and we will need some logic for actually controlling the orchestration. 
Yeah. Um, and we need stuff in there, like we need to know what version it is we're releasing and things like that. And that's all part of the build. And we need to get that back up out of the build so we can use that later on. Yeah. OK. So use shell step, use unzip, uh, and then read that file from the workspace. Yeah, I mean, we could even kind of pipe some stuff with awk and sed. Yeah. That, that would work, yeah. The oh. traditional Linux way, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's no unzip on Windows. So then if Windows do some bash, blah, 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 and else do shell step, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that, that's OK for kind of if we're running on Windows, but we still don't have an unzip on Windows. Yeah, so I've heard this cool thing called PowerShell. Yeah, I can, I can code in PowerShell. Um, that's not too bad. There's also Sigwin. Yeah. Um, but Pipeline doesn't have PowerShell support. No, but it's just a script. So we can write it to a temporary file. We can then have a batch file to call PowerShell with an argument to this temporary file that we've just written. So that'll work. Yeah, and what if you are going vacation? Because I can't hack PowerShell. Oh, well, <laughs> you're not contacting me on vacation. When I'm on vacation, that's it. Sigwin means that we will have even more Snowflake servers. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's those Docker things as well. Yeah. So let's ask Jesse what he thinks. Yeah. And he, he, he always says use shell steps. Yeah. If in doubt, use a shell step. It is, yeah, um, but we already com we, no. We've ruled that out. You can't <laughs> use a shell step. So OK, so, 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 so let's set up a rule here that when it's just utility functions and when it's quick to run and when it's just easier, fuck it, let's write a plugin. <laughs> so we this did. is available. Uh, the pipeline utility steps plugin, it contains some nice things like unzip, zip, you can test the zip, uh, you can. Uh, uh, touch a file, things that you normally can do on a Linux machine but can't do on a Windows machine. So yeah. these are sort of they're written in Java, which means they're cr cross-platform. If you have any other tips on what we can put in there, feel free to throw but in if, a pull request. If you do write your own plugin, you kind of need to make sure that it's idempotent what you do, because if the Jenkins master does go down or it loses connectivity, then when it comes back up, it's going to restart from where it was. And because you're in the plugin, it'll go, well, I was running this, so it'll start running it again. So it could end up doing the same thing again. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So let's just keep these sort of steps really short and sweet, like touch and yeah. stuff like that. Right. OK. That mm -hmm. solves that bit. Um, those tests that take eight hours to run. Yeah, and Very you... slow. We have three different test suites that we run on, on the products that we have uh, above sort of the normal unit tests. And they are slow. Yeah, but we want to run these on pull request builds, right? Yeah, or every commit. And who, whose credit card are we using for these build resources? Well, I don't mind. As long as I, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> just going to put my pull request in. I'll wait until I've got the build result back because I don't want a context switch. Yeah. Eight hours is not good enough. That's all so, right. I, I get a lovely free day. <laughs> so let's try to make these faster. There is, we could run fewer tests. Mm, really? <laughs> we could make them run faster. Yeah, why, why don't we do that? Uh, take a couple of months to optimize that. Yeah, OK. Uh, um, we can get faster hardware. There's more yeah, law. That's great. We can just rely on that. Yeah. Or, but I mean, we settled at the end on just trying to make these run in parallel. Um, we are sort of, of course, continually looking at option one, but uh, if we uh, just get faster hardware, sort of more slow doesn't really catch no. up with the amount of tests that we are adding all the time. Um, yep, three different test suites. So the first one, is the acceptance test harness. This is a community project that we also run on, on, on our own product. Uh, it's sort of a black box test using Selenium to point and click in the Jenkins UI and see. 
Uh, that I've seen in a serial way that could take about eight hours to run. That was one year ago, and there's been added stuff onto okay. that as well. Well, there's some plugin, yeah, isn't there, that will kind of take a load of yeah. tests and will kind of put them into buckets based so on how luckily, long they take. So luckily, one of the first plugin that's, that was actually pipeline compatible that I remember is the parallel test executor plugin. It has a, a split test step. Um, that analyzes, it takes the test results from a previous run of the same job. And then if you, you can tell it to sort of split this up in eight buckets or nine buckets or 250 buckets, whatever you need. And uh, then it can then split these tests up in the same manner as sort of, so they take equal amount of time. Okay, well, let's, let's do that, that sounds brilliant. Yeah, and just, chug that into a parallel step and, and run the same thing with just the excludes from that. Wow, this is going to be a really short talk. <laughs> yeah. But... Oh, yeah. Um, in Pipeline, when you have multiple JUnit reports and you kind of record them, it all gets squashed into one big report. And yeah, we're running so multiple different test types, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, so that means that the the parallel test executor will actually take all the tests from the previous run and split up that. So that could mean that we will then have a parallel step with an exclude list that doesn't exclude anything because oh. it's not part of that test so, suite. So we can have one bucket that still takes eight hours to run? Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Or a couple of buckets that runs the same test a couple of times. Uh, so uh, this makes me cry every time I see this solution. We need a new pipeline job for each test suite. And there is the build step where we can just call that the traditional sort of pipeline with freestyle job way with sending parameters. That job ar archives, for example, we could archive the test results in there and pull those back with a copy artifact. Oh, and then we can record them at least so you can still see all of those test results in the main pipeline so we don't have to go looking at these. 500 different jobs. Yeah, for but it okay. will still be a big mess. Uh, we were even promised uh, over a year ago that matrix support is coming soon. That's still on the drawing board. So soon we will have some form of equivalent of matrix and pipeline. So the next test suite is the plugin compat tester. This is kind of a cool thing in my mind. James doesn't really care uh, much for no, it. No, no. But we can use the same kind of thing, right? We yeah. just use the split tests and whatnot? No, because that works in a very different way. What it does is that it takes uh, the, a list of plugins, either the list from the Jenkins war file itself, and then it sort of builds the plugin with the version of Jenkins core that the plugin claims to support. But then it runs the tests on the core version that you yourself want to test on. And this is a good indication of, will this plugin survive on this core version? Is it sort of future compatible? Um, and it could, on just the plugins that we put into the war file, this is before Jenkins 2, Dotto, just, you know. uh, that run takes about 16 hours. So that's basically run it over the weekend kind of thing. So that's, we, we can solve yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, now, yeah? We, we could write a similar algorithm as split test. Um, and sort of, yeah, because the pipeline is groovy and groovy is code. Yeah. So so copy paste. I mean, so I figured we figured out sort of. If we take the report XML from a previous, previous PCT run, uh, we copy that into the workspace, slurp it up with the X, uh, XML slurper, to, and just list up all the short names, divide those up to equal size buckets that we get from the split test algorithm, and then same thing, the parallel steps, allocate a node, and then just run whatever just that shorter list of plugins okay. in, in yeah, parallel. Yeah. You work on that, and I'll do something else. Yeah, so that took me maybe an afternoon. Uh, I had 20 lines of beautiful, groovy, groovy, groovy code. And you know how the story goes. But... Yeah. 
I need so. to pause a bit and talk about the groovy CPS here, I think. Uh, uh, pipeline scripts don't run in a normal sort of groovy engine. We could simply say simply that, that the groovy CPS engine is the one that allows you to um, sort of just shut down Jenkins, start it up, and it will continue where it was. So, it's, yeah, so it kind of remembers all your state. Yeah. Um, okay. And that and there are bugs in there. And uh, you, the sort of standard default groovy methods that makes groovy very groovy uh, is like each collect, find all. They don't work. They did for a while and then they didn't and yeah. Uh, but then they might work again in Jenkins too because that's now using the newer groovy. Yeah, but that but actually broke it oh. even more. So yeah. And when you have variables in your pipeline, those, all of them needs to be serializable because the CPS engine is continually storing its states to disk. OK, so that kind of means that all these open source libraries that we want to use that haven't implemented the serializable stuff, we can't use any of them. No, oh, because really? they need to be serializable. And then we're also running in the Groovy sandbox because we are not admins and we don't trust some of us. So, and that whitelist is far from complete. It's continually getting better, but when I did this algorithm, I mean, map.size wasn't whitelisted. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we can at least kind of help that a little bit, can't we? Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it, at, in the beginning it was change something, run it, wait two hours, get an error that you're on using something bad like map.size, fix a whitelist that in the in the custom whitelist, and then move on. And but so, uh, yeah, in, in the end, I I actually created a job that you can see there called Bobby's little whitelist trainee, which is basically a pipeline job where I put in small snippets of code that I plan to use and run it, and it breaks, and then I allow it in the sandbox, and then I run it again and. So basically training the whitelist. So if you're uh, not sure something's whitelisted, check it out first so you don't have to wait two hours to find out that it's not whitelisted. Yeah. And that sandbox also has some issues oh. or bugs in it. Um, for example, one of those I've tried to fix uh, those anonymous properties in the XML slurper, the gpath result. So if you slurp something up, you can then navigate the, uh, the XML uh, quite easily, but the sandbox doesn't support that because those aren't really properties, they are something else, and it doesn't know what to do with that, so you can't really whitelist that. So that little just one-liner that I thought about, XML slurper, parse text, document plugin, dot each, no. doesn't work. So after about one week, of distilling this down. Uh, am I skipping a slide? No. Yes. No, I am not. So let's talk about how to fix this. Uh, there is the annotation called non CPS. So we talked earlier about the CPS engine. Yeah. There's a way to completely bypass it then. Yeah. Okay. So by putting a function inside, uh, annotating it with non CPS, that's basically turns off the CPS engine, we could say. And that the, then you can use all these groovy, groovy things, uh, like find each, uh, collect, all yeah. those nice things. But that means that you will have to do uh, quite a lot of things. Um, the code will still be processed by the sandbox. So those quirks that I talked about, like in the XML slurper or any other sort of bugs that might be in there will still be in effect. Uh, you can't get out of security, hopefully. OK, but we can work with that. Yeah, um, but just for cautionary tale, that if you put any step inside this non-CPS function, that basically makes that non-CPS annotation void, because then you're back into the CPS engine again. So don't do this below example. That and means that you will have functions that you sort of need to get a script, so read it, you do the read file outside, call into your function that does something very quick because it might restart in there and then go back and 
And you won't get any error or warning or about this. It will just kind of happen silently. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I noticed it when I finally took it into with live data instead of my example data. That so my algorithm was now supposed to be uh, looping over a set of things, but it only looped over one thing. So that's why I noticed that each didn't work, and I had to do this. Okay. Yeah, but it took me a week, and my 20 lines of beautiful groovy groovy code turned into 200 lines of college-level Java. Well, yeah, but it runs, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's not groovy. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so don't try to be fancy. Yeah, and pipeline is the orchestration layer first and foremost. Yeah, so if you have build logic or as much logic as possible, put that in external scripts. As GSSA, say, use shell scripts. Yeah, and when you can't? Keep it fucking simple. Excuse my European accent. Um, yeah, and <laughs> if you do need to use something like Matrix, then having yeah. multiple jobs is the current workaround. It makes me cry. It makes us all cry, but it works. And Not supposed to be like this. Yeah. So uh, those were sort of the big things. Uh, and throughout, we figure out some other do's and don'ts. As yeah. Well. So things will go wrong. Something will fail. A unit test will fail, or some infrastructure will fail that you're deploying to. So be prepared. It's kind of one thing that we didn't think of at the start, but we really did need to think about it. Is Things will go wrong. So it's no good kind of having your big pipeline and then just like you would in freestyle, go send an email at the end when it passed or failed and go, it failed. It failed. It's like it's not just building some plugin anymore. Now it's building the plugin, testing the plugin, building the wire. It's like which bit failed? And the current way, unless you're using the the, the simpler, simplified version that was demoed yesterday is you will put a lot of try catch or maybe even some finally blocks in your script yeah. to be able to catch and find out where things went wrong. And these libraries that we have that we're checking out, they kind of change. Um, so every time you, you clone something or you're checking out these libraries, have a change log. Um, make sure it's enabled. Or so. at least, or preferably both, um, echo out the library version into the build log so that it's simple to find out which version you accidentally ran if you. Yeah, and don't forget to change the version in the file <laughs> when you change the file. Yeah, or however you choose to solve because that. Because we've got a lot of scripts in one repository, and we might have pulled everything in. The repository might have moved on, because there might have been five more commits. But all the scripts and everything that we're using might be the same. So the big change log is great. But we also know, kind of want to know more at a fine-grained level. Yeah, and then we have those pesky, flaky tests as well. No, we don't. We don't have any flaky tests. <laughs> <laughs> that I preferably, uh, my personal mantra that I've heard from others is, if you have a, it's better to have no fla test than flaky test. But if we, at the place where we were back then, is that if we were to remove all the flaky tests, that would mean that we actually didn't have any tests. <laughs> yeah. So let's just run them multiple times. When they fail, you can do that with Maven, right? Use yeah. some flag, and we just need to kind of track and report that. So. Yeah. And when you have these functions in your libraries, your pipeline libraries, try to keep them short. Because then you can sort of train your whitelist on it. You can, uh, we can, you can test them if you've got short yeah. functions. You can actually write a, a test Jenkins file just to test your, your function. So you can have a whole set, separate test, which would kind of like unit test your yeah. pipeline functions. And that's a good thing. And some optimizations that we figure out. I mean, th th this is basically. 101 Jenkins knowledge, but well, it's Jenkins file knowledge, yeah. but nobody tells you it. It's kind of stuff you have to work out for yourself. Yeah, like if you put an input inside a node, that means that the node will still be locked and used. And so, if we're waiting for four hours 
five hours for someone to kind of approve something and we're running all these stuff on the big beefy Amazon box that costs however much per hour. Yeah, yeah. we're not going to be able to use that for anything else because it's going to be locked. Yeah, and timeouts, I sat down on an airport once and sprinkled some timeouts throughout our pipeline and I should have been thinking a bit more thoroughly of where I put those. So, uh, yeah, if you put a timeout around a node block and kind of your, your, your big build step, You've got to think that there's the provisioning time for that node. So if all your nodes are busy. Yeah. And then there is the James Nord operator that didn't really work. Yeah. Well. So that James Nord operator was, <laughs> it was a, yeah, it's I, the I concurrency love it. part of the stage that used to be there. It's great theory in practice. Or great theory. It's great theory. But um, I it, couldn't understand that theory. Oh, it just allows you to back <laughs> off. So if you have a buildup of jobs, it allows you to throw the old ones that are just yeah. uninteresting on the floor. Yeah. So um, now to control concurrency, there is the lock step instead. And milestones, there is a PR open to, but it's. Yeah, I we don't think it's merged yet. No, we haven't quite worked out how best to solve that problem yet as far as the syntax is concerned. So it's not there. Yeah. Um, Stash over archive. Yeah, um, we don't want all those pesky, non-important things in the archive list. Yeah. Um, so let's go for the final lessons learned. Convert what you have as is, if you're converting, and then adapt and improve. Don't try to make everything pipeline beautiful to start off with. Yeah. You need to know your environment and keep it consistent. Um, when you are trying to use unzip and unzip isn't there, it's no good finding that out kind of halfway at the end when you're just going, oh, let's add a Windows thing into yeah. this. Mix. And don't, don't try to be fancy. Again, don't try to be fancy unless you have months that you can spend on this. And months. <laughs> uh, put logic in external scripts and yeah. so, so that you can avoid this non-CPS calling back and forth. And and if you really, really need to use and build libraries, use the new shared library feature. That Jesse demoed yesterday. Maybe Jesse will show that off in his talk after this. I'm not sure, but maybe. Hmm. OK. So thanks for listening. And if anyone's got any questions. Three minutes for questions. <laughs> A list of which functions that don't work in the CPS engine is basically assume the worst. <laughs> Anything that makes groovy groovy uh, um, would be my. But, but there are open tickets in the open source Jira uh, with most of these there. Otherwise, and yeah. they are trying to fix them. Um, it's one so of KK's airplane projects, probably. Uh, the, the custom tool installer was, I'm not sure it is yet, but that basically for plugins needs to make sure that they are pipeline compatible. So, and, and that tool installer plugin, the custom tool installer, wasn't at that time. And not, I don't know if it has been adapted to pipeline yet. Debugging pipeline tips. Um, yeah, sprinkle echo. echo all throughout <laughs> your pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what, what I'm doing but when I write my, my pipelines is that I use uh, my IDE. And I, th there I have my code completion and all that nice things that is now a part of pipeline. And I have a script where I can basically just right click and run that on a local Jenkins machine. So I, I, like we said, we have just small functions that we try out. And then, hopefully, when we piece all these small functions together, if, each, if we know that each one of these works, then the whole pipeline should hopefully work. Otherwise, it's echoed steps. OK, we're out of time. But we're up, out in the booth if you want to have more personalized questions. So thank you. And yeah. don't forget to be awesome. And just because we've been, yeah. it sounds like we've been bashing pipeline, but we, we actually know, think it's, it's awesome. awesome.